Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for our DP Group webinar where we will discuss uh, green growth and sustainable development in Vietnam. My name is Gaia Ritzi, I'm Marketing Manager of Eastland and I'm connected from our Shanghai office. And I have the very pleasure of introducing to you our esteemed speakers of today, most of whom are connected from uh, Vietnam. And then we also have Mr. Bayano connected from Milan. And I will give you a better introduction of our speakers um, all along the webinar. So just to introduce you briefly who DP Group is, I'm going to uh, show just a couple of slides to introduce um, our firm and to explain what we're doing this webinar. So for instance, DP Group is an international uh, consulting firm with offices in three continents and our mission is to be present in every business uh, capital of the world to make the global business environment better through our work. Our structure as of today we count four companies, uh, the Andrean Partners Legal Council, which is our law firm, PhD Advisory Tax and Accounting, uh, specialized in accounting and finance, instant communication and events of which I'm representing today, and then Chantan Better, which is the educational uh, related service company. So among our practice areas of the joint partners, we span through uh, across the corporate practices useful for companies who want to invest in uh, foreign countries. So from corporate and commercial law to IPR, investments, dispute resolution, and so on. PhD Advisory is specialized in accounting outsourcing, tax compliance, financial supervision, business consulting. Eastern Communication, we mostly work with foreign companies in China in terms of events planning, social media management, and public relations. And then Chance and Better Education, which is our newest company, and it's focused on internships for students, for uh, professionals, as well as language training and online education. Um, if you're interested, we are specialized in publishing a wide range of guides, international-wide and also China-wide. And here, just to mention that recently we got our latest guide, Doing Business in Vietnam, released in Italian, in the Italian news sense uh, of the country. But it will also be available soon. So in case any of uh, in English, so in case any of you is interested in receiving it, just drop us an email, and I will make sure to share it with you. Here, if you're interested in uh, getting in touch with our professionals in any of our offices, I will also send to you this PPT along uh, with the speakers ones at the end of the webinar, so you will have all the information. Now that said, um, I am very glad to leave the floor to. Michele Dercole, who is the chairman of the Italian Chamber of Commerce in Vietnam, for the opening. So, Michele, thank you for joining us, and the floor is yours. Thanks, thanks Gaia, and thanks, DAP Group. As uh, I Chan, we are always uh, quite happy to support the event. We already, maybe already two, three times this year, also last year. We try, and this, this time, the topics is very, very, very interesting because sustainability, green energy is one of the topics that many people talking, but really not always from the words, we back to the facts, but maybe today with these also speakers that have you know, the knowledge and the expertise, we will get more information about what's happened for this kind of sustainability and green, and green energy. Of course, the, the pandemic is create a climate crisis but, uh, but also represent a significant opportunity to make our economy and society more sustainable, healthier, and therefore more future-proof. It is a fundamental challenge that requires the best technological, institutional, political, social, and cultural resources. It has been taken forward without leaving anyone behind, without leaving anyone alone. Europe has accepted this challenge by mobilizing significant assets around uh, the themes of cohesion, green transition, digital economy, innovation, and by committed to the goal of reducing CO2 emissions to zero by 2050. Also in this environment, Italy is, is quite uh, active on international market, thanks to the ability to combine competitiveness 
the environment of social cohesion, innovation, and ancient tradition, empathy, technology, beauty, human capital, and uh, communities. Maybe not all of you knows that Italy is uh, made in Italy product is getting uh, always greener. There are more than 400,000 Italian companies in industry and services that invest in green technology product between 2015 and 2019. And also Italy is, uh, Italy ranks second in the world for export of green product. According to the University of Oxford, Italy ranks second in the world per green complexity index behind Germany and followed by USA, Austria, Denmark, and China. But uh, back to the topic about the, the, the green energy, the largest uh, renewable energy operator in, in the world is Italian. Enel, with its uh, subsidiary green power, is the world's largest private operator in the renewables sector. With over 49 gigabytes estimated at the end 2020. First in the Dow Jones Sustainability World Index for Electric Utilities Sector. So due to this choice, it has recently reached a new record market capitalization exceeding 90 billion euro to establishing itself the leading company in Europe for utility sector. So as also Italian Chamber of Commerce, we try to follow also in Vietnam about the solar power and green energy. And just this year in April, before unfortunately the lockdown stopped any event in presence. We organize in collaboration with Beck, and we are here between our speakers, Federico Bestiani, we organize an event in one of the Italian factory, one of the biggest Italian investment factory in Vietnam, Datalogic. In the factory, we organize this event on solar power factory. Of course, then uh, in, in Federico will talk more deeply about that, but we talk in, in April, with over 40 people attending the factory, we saw the product there. I mean, the solar panel in the, the applied, of course, in, in the factory, with also the presence of other Italian companies, Bonfiglioli, that also follow the same example of the solar power factory, and the presence of also our Council General. So we organized this event. Unfortunately, there is a second event to organize in Hanoi, but we're still waiting when the situation, COVID situation, we can allow us to do it. So just in conclusion, I want to say that as Italian Chamber of Commerce, we are very sensitive and we are on top of this, of this topic. And uh, many factors in Vietnam, also the following speaker, we will talk about that. The presence of the solar or the wind of the green energy in Vietnam is growing a lot. Also Eurocham with the sector committee that we talk later, we talk about that. So, it, Vietnam is continue to grow, even there is, you know, some, not all the energy produced from in Vietnam is green, but they are on the way, on the right way to improve the production in the green quality. So I mean, I will stop here and I give the floor for the next speaker. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you, Michele. And as you were saying, it's always a pleasure for us as well to cooperate with the Italian Chamber. We host regular events, so um, let's say we will keep everybody posted for the upcoming one, hopefully uh, around September. And now that said, it is my very pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Mr. Frank Pogere, who is the Vice Chairman of the Green Growth Sector Committee of Eurotown. So Frank, the floor is yours and I'm going to share the PPT. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks also for the invitation and good afternoon to everybody from Ho Chi Minh City. Um, I'm going to talk about um, water issues in Vietnam. I mean, water and sanitation is, of course, at the core of uh, sustainable development and green growth. And I will be shedding some light on the situation here, uh, on business opportunities, challenges, and, and, and uh, well, the sector in general. 
Um, I am representing uh, the Green Growth Sector Committee, which is a sector committee under the European Chamber of Commerce in Vietnam. Yes, thank you. Uh, which has been established in 2014. Um, we are one of many sector committees. Uh, oh, no, sorry, that's too far. Can you go back, please? Yeah. Um, and um, our uh, Green Growth Sector Committee is focusing, of course, very much on renewable energy. That's quite a, there's a lot of uh, work to be done um, on energy efficiency, on environmental technologies, which include water and waste and sanitation, financing of green business, sustainable buildings, and so on. <clears throat> um, we, within the Green Growth Sector Committee, we have uh, a number of working groups, and the Water Working Group is one of, uh, of them. Um, actually, what we are doing is advocacy work. So we are aiming at Vietnamese national uh, institutions and decision makers. Um, we are trying to reach out and um, explain the expectations of the European companies in Vietnam uh, on uh, environmental issues and, and green growth. Uh, we are publishing the so-called Green Book. I think a new one is under preparation, which uh, summarizes the uh, environmental issues in, in Vietnam. And uh, Eurochem in, in general is uh, um, regularly publishing the White Book, which is also a tool of advocacy work in Vietnam. So next one, please. Next slide, please. It's the, I think it's coming to yours is a little bit slow, but it's coming. Yeah, I see it, yes, thank you. Okay, have a, have a quick uh, look into water supply and, and sanitation. I mean, uh, this is uh, quite interesting if we, if we compare, compare these two sectors. The water supply is characterized by a very stable water supply in urban centers. This is uh, really a big achievement in Vietnam. Uh, while we have very little or poor water supply in rural areas, especially in, in areas where ethnic minorities are living. living. Uh, in the water supply area, we have a relatively high degree of coast recovery. That means the terrors are more or less covering uh, the coast. <clears throat> and uh, we see that the operators are uh, sufficiently trained uh, to do their job. Um, there's a lot of in investing going on in the water supply business. Um, most of the public water companies have been privatized by now, which means there's also a lot of uh, competition in that sector. The picture is totally different if you look into the wastewater disposal side. Um, uh, wastewater treatment is not sufficient at all. We are talking about maximum 13% of wastewater being treated in Vietnam. We have a lack of infrastructure especially in rural areas and, and peri-urban areas. Uh, the sector is completely underfunded. We, we, we don't see any relevant wastewater charges being levied. Um, there is a lack of training and education. Uh, there is very little interest for private investors to invest into wastewater infrastructure because the prices are so low and the cost recovery is close to zero. Uh, and we see little competition um, among uh, international uh, investors. Next one, please. So, um, for international uh, companies, uh, you might ask the question, what are the areas that are of interest? Um, well, there are a lot of international tenders uh, from development banks like World Bank, Asian Development Bank. This is, of course, a very interesting uh, business opportunity. It's transparent and uh, it makes a lot of sense to have a look into that uh, kind of business. Um, delivering components um, to uh, Vietnam is, of course, something that makes sense. And by the way, Italian companies are very strong in that. There are lots of Italian companies providing uh, technology to Vietnam. Um, problem is, as usual, the price. Uh, the Vietnamese tend to go for the lowest price. So if there are uh, competitors from Taiwan, from Vietnam, from China that are cheaper, you probably won't have uh, a lot of chances. <clears throat> so consulting and planning services are in high demand, especially when we are talking about international standards. Um, 
international customers, let's say international companies being present in Vietnam are a very interesting a group of potential clients. I mean, Coca-Cola in Vietnam is producing at exactly the same quality standards as they do in the US or wherever. So uh, the requirements for their suppliers, engineers, and so on um, are relatively high. Um, we see a lot of um, uh, demand um, in point of use drinking water. That means people are very, very skeptical on the quality of their drinking water. So most people are somehow treating their water at home. Um, uh, digitization and water 4.0 is a, a big buzzword here in Vietnam at the moment. Um, Vietnamese water companies are very, very open for this kind of uh, innovation. And what we see, but which actually doesn't really take off, is um, project, project financing through international partners like BOT and EOO. But I think I will talk later about that a little bit more. Next, please. So uh, for your business in Vietnam's uh, water sec uh, sector, here are a number of tips and recommendations. The price is always decision criteria number one. There's no way around that. So uh, usual international prices can only be charged where there is no local or regional competition. Otherwise, you don't have a chance. Um, so um, that means as an international company coming to Vietnam, you need to specialize. Uh, you need to uh, have something very special that is not yet available in the market. As I mentioned before, everything uh, related to uh, digitization and water 4.0, also sponge cities, storm water management, flood protection. These are things that are coming up very, very quickly, and uh, there's a very high demand for international expertise. This one. Here are a number of, of projects of European companies. This is an Austrian company that did a very, very big water uh, supply uh, plant uh, in Hanoi. Next one, please. Uh, this is my company. We are doing a lot of uh, work in uh, development aid. Uh, we are doing a lot of training and education with wastewater companies. Next one. <clears throat> um, Decentralized wastewater treatment, uh, supplying specialized and uh, innovative solutions is also something that European companies can, can offer. This is a small uh, containerized wastewater treatment plant in Haiphong. Next one. And last but not least, I would like to um, highlight financing opportunities in, in, in Vietnam's water sector. Uh, as I said before, International development banks, that's a very safe thing. Uh, they have transparent tendering processes. Um, they are um, in the country. They are, work, they are used to work with international partners. Um, that makes a lot of sense and you will get your money. However, on the downside, there's a lot of global competition going for those projects. And you have to be aware that the payments and the management goes through the local project management units, and uh, the past showed um, that this might be a potential problem. Vietnamese tenders, uh, to cut it short, forget it. Uh, there is no way uh, you wouldn't like to do that. It's in intransparent. The processes are not understandable. Uh, there is usually no direct uh, access for foreigners. So you have to come in with um, joint venture partners, uh, which is not what you, in many cases, would like to do. Uh, there might be now a change to the European-Vietnam free trade agreement, but not clear yet. And there's a very, very high risk uh, in terms of payments. Coming up is something new. It's international organizations um, financing climate fund projects, climate, uh, climate change projects. Uh, I have uh, indicated a number of institutions here. You can see the logos. They are more and more coming and working in Vietnam, and they are, in many cases, big players with a lot of money, and they are definitely interesting to look at if you want to make water business in Vietnam. Next one. That was it. A very quick overview on water and sanitation in Vietnam. If you have additional questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. I'm located in Ho Chi Minh City. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Fave. It was extremely interesting. Um, and what I can say is that probably many from our audience will think the same because I see from the attendees, we have many Europeans 
uh, directly connecting from France, Germany, UK and Spain in particular, along with many other Europeans who are connecting from Vietnam. So as I said, if um, at the end of the webinar, the speakers will allow, I will also be happy to share the PPTs with the attendees. So for any kind of information, you can also follow up directly with our speakers. Then I see there are a couple of Q&A that are coming, but I will uh, postpone them for the end. So while saying this, thanks again, Mr. Pagare, for joining us today. And I hope to get, you, get back to you later for the Q&A for some questions that I have. Great. Now, passing to the next speaker, we have Mr. Federico uh, Bastia Bestiani, director of Bestiani Engineering Company. So Mr. Bestiani, I'm very happy to leave you the floor for your presentation. Hello everyone, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Federico, I'm the director of uh, BEC, Bestiani Engineering Company, and uh, um, Today, I will share with you um, our experience uh, in Vietnam in the past uh, three years uh, about uh, the um, green power and especially about the solar power for uh, industrial application. I have uh, a, a small presentation that I will share that I will share with you. Okay, can you can you see that? Yes, we can see that. Great, great. So I will start by introducing a little bit uh, our company. Uh, our company is the spin-off of our uh, uh, family company that was found a long time ago in Milan. And uh, we have been uh, operating uh, in Vietnam uh, on the field of uh, rooftop uh, solar power for more than three years. And up to date, uh, we have uh, developed and built uh, more than uh, 46 solar system with a total capacity of about uh, 10 megawatt. What we do in Vietnam uh, is uh, the uh, full engineering and construction uh, operation of the solar systems uh, and uh, also provide the finance solution, as I will explain uh, later. Here is some example of uh, the system that we built here in Vietnam. Uh, we, we made project uh, in the north, in the center, the south, uh, Haiphong, uh, Ho Chi Minh, mainly for international uh, customers. As uh, Frank was saying, it is a very good uh, opportunity because uh, um, we're working with the international uh, customers, we can uh, um, uh, have a good appreciation for the high quality of the systems. And we also organize some uh, education event uh, in collaboration uh, with uh, ICHAM. And uh, this is uh, one event that Michele was mentioning before uh, that we organize uh, in DataLogic, uh, where we invited uh, our uh, customers and the interested uh, companies uh, to come and see uh, and touch by hand uh, one of the solar system in operation and to understand how it works. It, I think it's very interesting uh, experience that uh, we will sure uh, repeat in the next uh, in the next future. So how, how to integrate uh, the solar power into the manufacturing uh, business? It is uh, uh, quite uh, easy and have many advantages uh, to integrate the rooftop uh, the solar panels uh, into the factory uh, work. Um, it has a, a very easy integration to the existing electrical system of the factory. It can save uh, a lot in the electricity bill and it also can uh, reduce the temperature inside the factory by reducing the temperature of the roof, and it can increase the sustainability commitment of the factory. Now I will uh, uh, present all these uh, four points uh, one by one more in uh, detail. So for, for the uh, integration into the existing electrical system of the factory, this is very, uh, very straightforward because uh, the way the solar system works the solar panel uh, turn the solar power into electricity, into direct current, and this direct current is uh, uh, converted into uh, alternate current by the inverters. The inverters that are used in this application is called synchronized inverters, so they can create a, a form of electricity which is perfectly the same as the electricity that is coming from the grid. 
So the factory doesn't have to modify anything about the, uh, their system, and they can really almost plug and play the, the solar system into their uh, factory. Then how, how the, the solar system uh, make uh, a saving in electricity for the factory? Here we can see in this slide the, the price of the electricity in Vietnam for the manufacturing companies. Is, it is divided uh, into time of use. So basically during the, during the day, uh, the factory need to pay a standard uh, price, but uh, in the late morning and in the evening, uh, this price increased much and uh, is a peak tariff that is increased the cost for the factory a lot. And when we compare this time for the, uh, for the different price and the, the, the power that is produced by the solar system, we see that the solar system produces uh, most of the power in between the late morning and the early afternoon. So the price uh, of the electricity on this time is quite high, and this can contribute uh, to a very high electricity uh, cost saving for the factory. Another advantage, as I said, that the, the solar panel, when uh, installed on the roof, they can uh, create, uh, they can absorb all of the solar energy and so the solar energy will not turn into heat and uh, will uh, therefore cool down the roof. Uh, in the picture, we can see two factories, they are identical. On the left, the factory do not have solar panel and on the right it has a solar panel. And the temperature of the roof uh, is, uh, is very different, is uh, over 15 degrees of different. Uh, this can improve uh, the, the living conditions and the working conditions uh, inside uh, the, the, the factory floor. And of course, uh, when, uh, when uh, a factory install the solar panel and, and uh, uh, use the renewable energy for this process, uh, it can uh, unlock uh, more possibility by uh, entering the, the green supply chain. So uh, it can, uh, um, can fit to some uh, compliance by, by some uh, country compliance or some group compliance uh, in, in terms of use of uh, renewable energy. And uh, so many, many good uh, uh, advantage. So why, why all the, the factory owner do not invest in the solar system? There are several, uh, several issues that uh, a factory perspective uh, will have when approaching uh, an investment uh, into the solar project. Uh, mainly it requires a lot of capital to, to invest in this kind of projects. And uh, this technology usually is different from the company core business. So the factory uh, should build the internal technical expertise in order to evaluate the project. And this creates a lot of delay and uh, the project basically is not uh, usually implemented under the, under the investment uh, way. So, one popular way that is uh, used in this market, uh, not only in Vietnam, but also in, uh, in, uh, in Europe, uh, of course, is uh, the solar as a service or PPA uh, called the Power Purchase Agreement. Uh, maybe you already heard about this. Um, so today I will explain a little bit how it works and how uh, it is uh, uh, very easy to implement this kind of contract for a manufacturing uh, unit. So under this kind of contract, uh, the solar company act uh, as a investor of the solar system. So the solar company uh, design and build and own and operate the solar system. The factory do not have to make any investment for that. And, uh, and then uh, the electricity that is produced by the solar system will be sold from the solar company to the factory at a lower price in comparison to the national grid. So the factory do not have to make any investment and you can still have uh, all of the advantages uh, that uh, have um, coming from the use of the solar power. So in this case, uh, we can see here a chart how the, the solar company will invest into the solar project. And then the solar system will generate some power that will be used from the factory. And uh, if the factory need more power, for example, in the night uh, or where the solar power is not enough, we still continue to buy from the grid uh, like normally. Um, and the, uh, at the same time, the factory will uh, pay directly to the solar company for the solar power that they use um, with a lower price than the, than the electric grid. 
and for the night uh, will continue to buy uh, as before from the electricity grid. In this way, the factory can achieve uh, an immediate an immediate discount without uh, any investment. So here, here we can see an example of uh, one uh, one client that, that we have uh, after the integration of the solar system. We can see uh, in the red, the red line is the, the, the consumption of the factory. This factory work uh, night and day. And then we can see that uh, about uh, 6 a.m., the solar system start to work and start to increase the power until uh, uh, about uh, uh, 9, 9 a.m., the solar power cover the entire um, need of electricity of the factory. And there is even uh, some excess that is uh, uh, sent back to the electricity grid. And at about 6 p.m., uh, the solar system uh, stop working. So this is on, on average how, how the, the integration happens. Usually the, the, the factories, they can choose uh, two different uh, pricing based on uh, their uh, expectations. And uh, one is uh, the, they can uh, buy the electricity for a long term at a fixed price uh, that will not change uh, for the for the longer duration of the contract. Another way they can buy is uh, with a flexible price. So the, the price of the solar energy will be always indexed to the price of the local utility and will always be lower than that. Um, this, this kind of uh, contract can be implemented in uh, almost uh, all the factories. Um, just need to have uh, some, uh, some factors in, uh, in the checklist that need to make sure before considering these kind of contracts, which is uh, the factory should have uh, a, a, a right to use the land uh, more than 20 years, because usually the, the duration of these kind of contracts is uh, about 20 years. And you should have a stable electricity consumption. Uh, the building should also be in uh, good conditions and also the, the financial situation of the company should be in a, in a good uh, condition. In Vietnam, uh, usually this kind of uh, process uh, uh, is, a, is a quite fast. So if the factory is willing to implement uh, uh, the, the solar power on their roof, uh, the process is, is uh, quite fast from the very first uh, presentation meeting to the uh, end of construction. Um, last year, it normally take between three and six months. Uh, now with this year, maybe there is uh, some uh, delays uh, from, the, from the, the, the COVID situation, but usually this is a quite fast uh, way uh, compared to the self-investment that require much more time for the factory to evaluate the, the investment. So that's uh, all for uh, my, my presentation. If uh, you have uh, some, uh, uh, some further question or uh, if you think uh, that uh, your factory uh, could uh, take advantage of this kind of uh, contract or you, or you want to know more about that, um, you can uh, drop me an email and I will uh, share the, uh, more information about this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Federico. It was extremely interesting and actually if we're going to have some time later i have a couple of questions about the ppa which i find is a very um new at least for me kind of contract model now yeah, sure. that, yeah that said um i now have the pleasure to introduce mr antonio Bayano as representative of the italian chamber of commerce of southeast asia so uh, mr Bayano, the floor is yours Thank you, thank you for, to all of you. Thank you for inviting the Italian Chamber of Commerce for Southeast Asia to this important webinar, in particular for the importance of this topic. Uh, personally, I have the pleasure of being part of the Chamber since uh, 2009 and be a member of the Board of Directors. Uh, I'm normally based in Bangkok uh, uh, from this location and from our headquarters in Milan. We coordinate the various projects in the region directly and also thanks to our, uh, our network. Uh, I'm talking about uh, region because just as, uh, just as our name suggests, the range of action of the Chamber of Commerce is extended to entire, entire Asian area. Um, today we are focused on green growth and sustainable development with particular attention to Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam in this moment a leader in the entire region. Uh, in particular, our Chamber is following some project for our company members 
in sustainability and renewable energy in some countries. Um, although the sector has suffered a decline uh, in activity due to the pandemic, uh, we know that investment in sustainability and renewable energy are expected to steadily increase in this, uh, and this um, will lead the sector becoming one of the major drivers of the economies. Uh, we, know the, we know that the countries of the region have established, established an ambitious uh, five years energy cooperation plan uh, with a very important uh, goal to reach in targets in sustainability. An, ambi an ambitious plan, but which is uh, expected to become a primary objective, uh, objective so much so that some countries are already positioning themselves as a main players in the development of our renewable energy. Vietnam, of course, Thailand, Malaysia, for example, uh, with, with Vietnam absolutely uh, a leader. Vietnam, Vietnam is currently um, the, 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 the most active country, in, uh, for example, in reducing dependence on the coal and the mission. If I remember well, um, there is a forecast to reduce the CO2 emission uh, around 15% by 2030, maybe someone of you can correct me if, if I say wrong. Um, the country effort must also meet the growing demand of energy for sustainable socioeconomic development. This is another, another important uh, thing. Um, but uh, other, other, other countries in the region uh, then follow Vietnam. Thailand, just to give an example, with all the pandemic problems that the country is facing and that, that has slowed down the path. Uh, anyway, um, as part of alternative energy development, development plan, the Thai government has planned to generate um, energy production uh, from renewable sources of about 33% in 2037. There are also several projects for development of smart cities, for example. Um, in this country, we have an important comparison uh, with the DOI, for example, for the, the Thai Board of Investment, especially for the incentives uh, regarding investment in the sector. Um, and we are working also with uh, Asian Sustainable Energy Week, one of the most trade fairs involving the entire region. Uh, we are working in order to be able to involve some Italian companies in the next year's events which uh, we hope will finally be held uh, in attendance. So um, we are aware that the efforts that ASEAN countries will, help, uh, will have to, to make uh, to achieve goals in the, in the green growth will be greater than, uh, than those planned in the pre-pandemic period. It's a challenge uh, and it's not just for the pandemic. Despite uh, the real opportunities and appropriate policies, uh, countries will have to take into account some critical issues that define the project with the term challenge. Obviously, uh, not least Vietnam, given the direction taken, the development of the major project in the region can be a expensive bill to pay for some Southeast Asian countries, for example, as financial assets is uh, frequently considered a relevant factor in the development of the wide projects. Another factor may be the, the, the lack of experience uh, and expertise in some Asian member states, uh, precisely in assessing the risk of investment. Some countries are also, uh, in some countries are also present technical difficulties to, due to the regulations and the relation between public and private sectors. Uh, we can find also problems uh, of geographical nature in some part of the of the countries. Uh, anyway, the challenge must be won. Technological innovation, R&D, in particular investment and incentives are some of the elements of the increasingly shared policies with com common objectives that the countries of the region are implementing and that make this vast sector interesting and attractive. Uh, obviously, uh, our goal, uh, a target of our Chamber of Commerce is to be able to push and support the Italian know-how to penetrate more Southeast Asia, both at the level of possible joint ventures or investment. It is, it is also equally important that the Italian product can effectively enter in the supply chain. The supply chain in, in, the, in this sector, especially in this sector, can be very relevant to our, to our manufacturing. 
uh, we are working about this with some of our associates, for example. Uh, I think that there are all the credentials to tackle this path uh, successfully without forgetting some weapons uh, we have, such as the recent uh, FTAs, for example, uh, the, the one between European Union, Union and Vietnam is an example. Uh, we, we have done, we, let's not forget that in September 2020, Italy became a development partner of uh, the uh, ASEAN. Uh, I think it's, uh, it is therefore important to look at Vietnam and its future, considering different point of view as a possible target for the Made in Italy, of course, not only from a local point of view, but also as a, a relaunch platform towards other countries in the region. Uh, as a recipient of qualified know-how, as a sustainable environment for investment in different sectors in particular regarding its growth, its, its green growth. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce, of course, is uh, uh, open to extend the, its, uh, its network, its cooperation in, in this area. And we are looking to uh, find a good connection, especially with, uh, with the future of Vietnam. We are open to improving the network and cooperate uh, in, a, in entire the region. Um, this is my short presentation. I would like to thank you, um, all of you, for the, the kind attention. I will be here in just in case you need some, you have some questions. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, thanks for joining us today and for cooperating with us on this webinar. It was our first time as we were cooperating with the uh, Italian Chamber of Commerce in Southeast Asia, but I definitely hope uh, not the last one. And that said, I will also be glad to share your credentials with our attendees today so that if anybody wants to get directly in touch with you, they will have all the necessary information for that. Thank you. And now, last but not least, I am going to leave the floor to my colleague, uh, Filippo Scaglia, Legal Advisor of the NERD Partners Legal Council, connecting from, usually from our Hanoi office today, I guess, from home. Um, so, Filippo, the floor is yours, and thank you for joining us, too. Hey. <clears throat> thank you, Gaia. Thank you to all the previous speakers for the very interesting uh, presentation and speech. Now I will just share also my slide and go to a brief presentation. Let me confirm if you can see the screen. Yes, we can see it. Okay, perfect. Okay. So uh, as was, it was previously mentioned also by some of the speakers before, uh, Vietnam uh, uh, now has uh, is facing some challenges in uh, this kind of uh, in sector in the, the topic of uh, green growth and sustainability because uh, uh, Vietnam has made some ambitious commitment under the Paris Agreement, but the internal situation of the company on the energy side on the energy side uh, still needs uh, a huge development because. Uh, uh, as you will see, I, as I will show also in this slide and these graphs, as you can see, uh, Vietnam still uh, uh, highly relies on uh, uh, fossil fuel energy production. As you can see, 50, more than 50% uh, of any energy produced in the country came from uh, coal, came from coal, while the non hydro renewables cover only 5% of the national energy production. This uh, uh, because mostly because uh, 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 Vietnam has done it uh, this way in the last uh, 20, 30 years. And uh, the coal uh, plant uh, are, uh, uh, has a lower initial cost. And uh, that's why Vietnam has still rise on these type of plants. You know, otherwise, uh, it would be possible to keep the lower price for electric electric energy as uh, the, the country is doing and uh, the electric the electricity price is kept artificially low why because uh, the Vietnam country is growing so rapidly in the last uh, 10 years 15 years and to keep uh, the country attractive for investors uh, the government basically keep uh, an artificially low price uh, for uh, electricity, electricity energy. 
for uh, industrial purpose, but also to uh, to give more free will to the consumer market. And uh, these uh, yes, basically clash with the objectives, with the targets uh, of the goals of uh, green growth uh, or green growth of the countries. So what are uh, the main challenges that uh, Vietnam is facing? And uh, in the last uh, power development plant, the TDP-8, which, which basically uh, which has been released uh, in the beginning of uh, 2021, uh, Vietnam uh, basically sets uh, the goal for the next 10 years and uh, a vision for the next uh, 20 years. We believe that uh, these are the three main topics uh, that uh, should be discussed in this, uh, that have been discussing and they are included in, this, uh, in, this, in the PDP-8. The first one is uh, the reliance, uh, the hiring reliance uh, on coal and coke, and coke uh, plants uh, and also import for uh, other countries, which doesn't make sense anymore if you have to import uh, the raw material from uh, uh, third countries instead of getting from the, your own uh, resources. The second is the hydroelectric generation because uh, yes, hydroelectric generation is uh, well developed, uh, I would say. Of course, it can be better, but it's still one of the most developed in, in the country while the non-hydro-renewable sources only cover 5%, as I said before in the previous slide. Third one, but uh, maybe the most important one, is uh, uh, the underdeveloped grid to uh, transmit and distribute the electric energy in the country, because uh, uh, the, Trump is, uh, the Vietnam population is uh, about 100 million uh, people, and uh, basically one third 30 million of the people uh, lived in uh, big cities. This also means that two thirds of the countries, basically 70% of the population, still live uh, in uh, mainland in the rural zone, uh, up evenly spread uh, across uh, all the countries' uh, territory. And uh, the actual, the current uh, grid is not uh, enough to distribute it or distribute all this uh, uh, energy produced by the power plants. Now, getting more into details uh, on the PDP-8, uh, as you can see, this is the plan for the next 10 years uh, and a, a vision, let's call it, it's hard to make, uh, uh, foresee, to foresee the future for the next 20 years, but uh, this is still a try. As you can see, the only uh, action that we can say it's positive on the coal fire uh, power is that uh, they plan to uh, they don't plan to develop additional uh, new coal fired thermal power plants on the other side we see that instead uh, they plan to grow the gas to power and the wind power and solar power plant still uh, uh, it's a long distance it's very distant from the target uh, that uh, for example the european union posed for uh, their own countries uh, to reach uh, emission zero but uh, i believe that uh, vietnam can be proud if uh, they really keep to the plan stick to the plan and get to these uh, targets uh, it's a big step in this kind of uh, sector now regarding the uh, comparison between uh, the coal and gas and other power plants. We can see that uh, in the last five years, these are data, data from the 2016 to 2020, the coal and gas project uh, failed to progress uh, and uh, they only meet uh, half of the target uh, capacity, targeted capacities, meaning that uh, they underproduced uh, of the energy that were, they were expected to produce. While the renewables, such as a solar plant or hydro plants, hydroelectric plants, they over delivered by five times the expected the power producer, power production. And uh, these, uh, we, for an external viewer, these would be a good sign, meaning that uh, the renewables are high, higher, if they have a higher efficiency and uh, they have a lower cost. But the truth is that uh, all these discrepancy, all these uh, uh, over delivered power basically got wasted because of the uh, underdeveloped of the grid. The grid is not uh, uh, structured, the infrastructure that we are lacking infrastructure to deliver the electricity power to 
all the countries. So all these uh, overpowered, uh, overproduced power, it's it's wet because there are no infrastructures to storage. There are no infrastructure to deliver to the to all the countries. Then now regarding yes, exactly. Also, you can see that uh, uh, European Union is focusing their internal policy to uh, a more sustainable uh, to a more sustainable production of energy and uh, we can also think that uh, this could lead to a carbon border tax adjustment meaning that uh, uh, goods uh, or uh, that comes from uh, production uh, manufacturing facilities that are not that relies on carbon will get uh, a higher tax this is still it's, this is not uh, enforced currently, but uh, we can see that uh, the, in the European Union, the politicians are discussing about this. And despite the market appetite uh, for uh, renewable energy, uh, Vietnam still uh, is not meeting the request of the investors because uh, it happened before, uh, I don't remember if it was 2020, anyway, a few months ago, uh, we saw that uh, mostly in the fashion industries, uh, which for garments and other, uh, and other stuff, uh, they, are, they are a major force here in Vietnam and on the manufacturing side. Uh, players such as uh, Nike or H&M have pushed, have made uh, a public statement uh, to push uh, the government of Vietnam on, the, on a more sustainable uh, production of energy, asking to uh, enforce a possibility to buy directly, to, uh, to purchase directly to, from a manufacturer and from uh, renewable, renewable energy plants. Still, this is a huge sign. This is a big push from foreign investors, and uh, we hope that uh, the country of Vietnam uh, will get uh, will receive this uh, push. Now, I will gonna go a little faster because I believe I'm running out of time. So, as uh, Mr. Pogade previously anticipated, previously there are uh, many opportunities uh, coming mostly from uh, the uh, international organization and for international banks. Uh, such as the Asian Development Development Bank and the World Bank, these uh, the roles of these uh, international financial institution is to fill the gap between uh, the private sector and the Vietnam government. Because uh, the, the the problem with the private investor is that uh, the the first investment to develop this kind of plant is very high. And uh, the return on the investment uh, is going to be uh, relevant only in the long term. In the short term, it's very risky, such as uh, that uh, the bank, the local bank and the Vietnamese bank uh, are not inclined to uh, loan the funds for these kind of investments. This is where the international uh, financial institution can, feel, can, uh, uh, can intervene by providing loans, uh, grants, uh, to help the investor, the private investor participated in this kind of in this market in Vietnam. As you can see, they did before. They have there are some huge plant uh, production in uh, basically all across Vietnam in the north and south. Or maybe in the south is more windy and solar, but also in the hydrological power in the Mekong Delta. We uh, I heard, I remember that. Uh, it was a pleasure to see that uh, Mr. Bestiani before discussed about the PPA. I will now discuss about the PPP, which are the public-private partnership investments. This uh, is uh, the type uh, of uh, agreement uh, which uh, a foreign investors uh, enter when they decide to invest uh, in, uh, in the development of uh, a new power plant uh, or the uh, or uh, the new infrastructure for the power grid. Uh, as you can see, they, they, you have, there are two parts, the private parts, which are the foreign investor, and the public, which is the state-owned agency. Basically, uh, it means that you have to deal with uh, EVN, which is the major, uh, the, the only, so the, o, almost the only uh, power, electric power uh, provider servicer, service company. challenges in when you enter some these kind of agreement because uh, uh, you have to set up an entity 
local entity here. So the time gets longer because you have to uh, get the ERC, the Invest Enterprise Registration Certificate. You have to get the Investment Registration Certificates. This takes about uh, four to six months for this kind of investment, which are usually conspicuous. And uh, then uh, you also have to deal uh, with the bureaucracy of Vietnam. And this type of agreement uh, with the bidding procedure to get uh, the, the tenders uh, agreement, uh, it's very long in terms of time and uh, the results are uncertain. And so that's why the international community hopes to get to see this type of uh, agreement uh, to have an easier access to the kind of agreement to see the some amendments in the investment law there has been uh, a, last year in 2020 an amendment to the ppp law but still uh, not enough to meet all the requests now i will conclude and cut so i, I see that gaia is getting worried about the timing this uh, is a final uh, framework as you, you can see and uh, I would just say that uh, uh, the solution here should come from uh, private investors because, uh, because uh, it is essential their participation is, is, uh, kind of in this sector, in the renewable uh, energy sector. And also it is essential uh, the participation by uh, international uh, organization. We can eliminate the risk of the investment or at least mitigate the least investment by Founding and the granting loans and uh, and funds exactly. I believe for me that's it. I believe uh, I will give the floor to Gaia. Thank you. Thank you, Filippo. Thank you so much. And um, as you can see here now, I quickly invited my colleague from PhD Advisory, Mr. Nikita Polischuk, who is financial analyst. Because as I as I heard earlier, we quickly mentioned and went through taxes, taxation, how is the green financing working in Vietnam? I just thought to quickly invite him to go through that given, um, you know, PhD's experience with working with small and medium enterprises in Vietnam. So just for a brief remark, Nikita. Sure, thank you, Guy. Thank you very much, our esteemed speakers. Uh, if I may add just uh, a, few, a few lines on some of the uh, practical incentives that uh, Vietnam and the authorities have introduced in Vietnam. So, um, you know, first in Vietnam, as uh, the majority of the businesses uh, who are present are, are well aware, the standard corporate income tax rate is set at the rate of 20%. But for businesses which operate in the renewable energy sector, uh, the state has uh, intro introduced several uh, preferential tax rates as well as tax holidays. Uh, for example, uh, income which is derived from investment in the production of renewable energy is entitled to a preferential tax rate uh, of 10% for 15 years, and this can actually be extended further for the duration of the project. Uh, next, projects that uh, meet uh, certain requirements are to be qualified as the uh, environment protection project. So, for instance, installing renewable energy or, on the contrary, destroying uh, the pollutants, uh, such projects can enjoy the incentive uh, rate of 10% uh, as well uh, for the whole lifetime. Of, of the projects, plus additional exemptions are also uh, applied. And then next, there are also several preferential policies in Vietnam uh, for projects and for businesses um, that actually set up their, uh, their projects in so-called uh, uh, difficult socioeconomic areas, so essentially uh, the most emerging and the most developing areas in Vietnam. Uh, so businesses will be very welcome there. Um, of course, if in the same tax year, there are several schemes that can be applied, the most beneficial one will be actually used. Uh, second, uh, Vietnam introduced certain import duty uh, incentives. Uh, so for example, the renewable projects that uh, are exempt from import tax uh, for goods which later should form fixed assets, uh, or uh, they're also exempt from import tax for domestically uh, unavailable, unavailable materials and components. Uh, third, the authorities in Vietnam uh, actually introduce, uh, again, the incentives for projects uh, which are located in the difficult uh, uh, socioeconomic uh, regions of Vietnam uh, by actually offering exemption from the land tax um, and from the land lease uh, for the construction period of up to three years. And then 
for a further uh, of 11 to 15 years of the actual uh, operation of the project. And uh, lastly, uh, input VAT, input VAT refund. So essentially, input VAT corresponding to expenses uh, which were incurred during the construction period of a project, uh, those can be eligible for a refund uh, before the actual uh, commercial operation of the renewable project begins. So just you know, to quickly sum up all of this, as there are uh, still many of these issues and many of these incentives that investors should consider before making uh, making the final investment decision on the region and on the different uh, forms of the of the transaction. And uh, so for just you know, just for us, uh, uh, what we see a lot and what we would recommend is you know to have a first an overview of all the incentive schemes and uh, the legal factors, and finally uh, you know just to actually analyze and understand all the relevant documentations and application that uh, a business must do with the authorities in Vietnam. That's all for myself. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, with this, we conclude the presentations of today. I see that um, it's now time to close, but I have a couple of really interesting questions, in my opinion, that our audience would be interested in listening to. Um, and then for the other questions that I can't touch upon right now, please feel free to get in touch with me by email, and then I will direct you to the uh, specific speaker. Now, Mr. Vestiani, we actually got a question about a point that you touched upon earlier in your presentation, because you said that, for instance, the BPA is applicable uh, when a company has a 20 years leave at least going on. So they ask, in case you do not reach this requirement, what are the alternatives to BPA to uh, you know, get solar energy? Okay, this is a good question because uh, some factories uh, actually they uh, they have a, a lower time for uh, for the lease uh, uh, of the land. If uh, in our experience, uh, if the time of lease is uh, less than twenty years, um, even fifteen years can be can be applied uh, PPA. Um, in case the the factory is uh, is uh, in in another situation. Uh, renting uh, the, the the building for a short term maybe on a two year basis or three year basis in that case the the, the the ppa cannot be signed directly with the with the customer but instead uh, need to be um, agreed between the solar company and the owner of uh, the of the building uh, so this is uh, in a, in a, in our uh, in our experience Great, thank you. And now, um, Mr. Bogaday, if you're still online, I have a question for you. Yes, here you are. Um, because of your role within the European Chamber, and especially with the Green Growth Sector Committee, I got this question that I believe you could answer. You're asking, is green financing a viable avenue for foreign SMEs in Vietnam, or would you say it's more appropriate for larger companies? Sorry, again, what kind of financing? I think it's green financing. So anything related to green growth and this kind of financing for SMEs or, la or rather larger companies from your perspective. Well, no, I think there's now a lot, there are lots of opportunities for small scale companies as well. As I mentioned, and I showed some logos there, there are now so many um, funds and organizations that are investing, especially in small scale startup companies dealing with uh, green growth and uh, green environmental uh, issues. So uh, yes, I think there are options. Um, honestly, I do not have really a lot of experience with that because it's also relatively new, um, but it's worth, worth a look and uh, have a look at those um, institutions I have been mentioning there and, and what they are offering. Great. Thanks a lot. And now I have one last question before we run too long. Um, Filippo, they're asking something more related to the regulatory aspect. So they're asking, do you see any regulatory obstacle on foreign direct investment in the renewable sector in Vietnam? Mm, there are no obstacles. I would say there are uh, only some uh, challenges that uh, you have to face uh, in the terms, I mean, if you decide to invest in, in Vietnam, uh, you should know, you should be prepared uh, to some uh, challenges, but uh, nothing impossible with the right timing and, and with the right uh, assistance. 
it's a it's a target that you, you can reach. I see, Mr. Bestiani. <laughs> Do you want to add something <laughs> based on your experience? Maybe you can also give some advices on this. <laughs> Yeah, you need to have a very good uh, lawyer when uh, you when you <laughs> do uh, any business uh, in Vietnam because uh, uh, there are actually many many policies uh, uh, in place for all the sectors, including uh, yeah, including our sector, renewable energy. Of course, uh, uh, you need to take advantage of uh, all the available policies possible in order to try to reduce. Uh, the, the the investment payback as fast as possible, but it's not it is not uh, as straightforward uh, as uh, as uh, the people might expect. Need a lot of uh, work and uh, a lot of uh, paperwork uh, to actually uh, claim uh, the the advantage that uh, that is uh, is available. Right, but as I can see from your business example, anything is possible. So. Um, and that said, uh, I want to thank you all very much. It was a very pleasant webinar for me to moderate and seeing all the attendees are still connected. I believe that it was interesting for the audience as well. So thank you all very much to our esteemed speakers <clears throat> today. Nikita for joining us last minute, thank you. And this webinar is going to be on YouTube and then don't hesitate to follow us on our social media for any upcoming webinar um, specifically related to Vietnam. So with this, uh, I conclude. Thank you all again, and stay tuned for our upcoming event. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.